Dr. Kocha, we are live now. Right. So, good morning to all of you. A very warm good morning from <coughs> NABH. And uh, my name is Dr. Atul Mohan Kocher. I am the CEO of NABH. And NABH is very, very proud today to bring to you some master trainers uh, who are masters in their field, masters in their art. And this is a, a very, very important webinar for all of us. The next in the series of our Quality Connect initiative, learning with NABH uh, to all of you. And this very important theme today, mm -hmm. basic life support and revisiting code blue, visiting these skills together. So this is a, a, a fantastic uh, uh, opportunity for all of us to learn from four uh, master trainers who with a passion and zeal are going about the country to spread awareness about this very, very critical and important part of saving a human life. Uh, without much ado, uh, uh, I, I, I know that uh, thousands of people have registered for this training. Thousands of people uh, are keen to learn from them. So I will not come in between and I'd surely just like to introduce uh, uh, these people. So give, just give me a minute, sir, so that I can share the screen. We have with us Dr. Shakti Dutt Sharma. Uh, he is held, he is not only, all of them rather, are not only astute administrators looking after key hospitals, key departments, but they are very, very passionate critical care specialists. Currently, Dr. Shakti <coughs> Dutt Sharma uh, is at Baba Sai Bambedkar uh, Medical College and Hospital at Rohini, but he has spent a lifetime at Lok Naik Hospital. He's a state award winner for Best Doctor of the Year 2013-14. He has a huge number of publications. He is a principal assessor with NABH. He, uh, he's part of so many committees and he's, a, he's conducted workshops, CMEs, more than 500 in number. His uh, area of special interest mm -hmm. is exploring new ways of interaction, teaching, <coughs> training, resuscitation, life support, airway management, so on and so forth. Uh, I mean, uh, this just one slide will not do justice to you, sir, but welcome, uh, please, here. Thank you, thank we you. have with us uh, Dr. Rakesh uh, Kumar. Um, he needs no introduction. He's a director professor of anesthesiology at MAMSI, Bolana Azad Medical College. F more than 50 publications, more than uh, two books authored, um, editor of four books. He has more than 30 chapters, more than 500 workshops. So what can I say, sir? He has had all the major positions from president, training center coordinator, MAMSI, and training center of MAMSI is a, a very reputed place where all, I mean, I mean, there is nobody in the anesthesia fraternity who does not need uh, 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 to know Dr. Rakesh Kumar or all of the others. So he, he has won so many laurels, WHO fellowship, award of honor of meritorious service, international faculty at World Airway Management and his area of special interests are also the same uh, along with diabetes. I see that there, sir. Dr. Thank Sunil Kumar, sir. Dr. Sunil Kumar, sir. He is uh, the additional MS, uh, uh, Lok Naik Hospital. He has held all major positions, hands-on. We, we have all learned from him and he's a very, very passionate teacher and uh, his area of special interest include learning, teaching, resuscitation, uh, uh, all, all those things, sir. He has been associate editor of Basic Life Support and Atlas Based Approach. And this is one book we have all learned from. The second edition is now there. And he's also contributed hands on in more than 500 workshops. So, welcome, sir, Dr. Sunil, sir. Thank you, welcome. sir. We are grateful to have you and Dr. Anil Misra, sir, MBBS, MDDA, head of the Department of Anesthesia, his current position. Uh, He's a very, very suave, dapper, and a very sophisticated man. But his core area of interest uh, include learning, teaching, resuscitation, <coughs> life support skills. So, so practically all four are hand in glove in their passion and to take this mission of uh, creating awareness about basic life support to every person. So what I've learned from them, uh, if I can say in one word, is that they all want that the, uh, that the, uh, the last link, I mean, the guard at the door, the help in the office, they all should be made aware about basic life support. And one part when we look from NABH angle is that uh, code blue. I mean, we are, are used to observing code blue teams, all are used to observing uh, 
all these things. So th this is their passion. So Dr. Misra is also uh, the associate editor. He, he, he is a keen dramatization man and uh, we have seen him in action and so many real workshops. He has trained NABA staff also and he belongs to the proud family of uh, AFMC and sir is very, very well known. And all of them have contributed to more than 500. I mean, I mean, there is no corner of country which is there. So we are very proud to welcome all of you, sirs, for this workshop. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction, Dr. Atul. Please, sir. Please. Thank you so much. And uh, just a minute. Uh, I'll just shop the share. And all of you, welcome once again. And uh, <clears throat> we are really hopeful that uh, all those audience which are there and we'll be putting this webinar, this training on our website also. So all of you can keep on revisiting and learning uh, and uh, improving your skills from this thing. So I'll hand over to Dr. Rakesh, sir. Uh, yeah, he'll share the screen. I I'll share the screen and uh, Dr. Shakti will be with you to begin with. I'll share the screen, yes. Okay, and uh, this being already done, there we are. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Atul, for uh, inviting all of us uh, to this uh, webinar. Uh, and uh, we welcome all the uh, participants uh, who will be looking uh, into the skills with us. Uh, what is inside the code blue? So, we will be visiting the skills together. Uh, some of the skills. Uh, uh, we will be doing together and uh, let's uh, begin with the uh, code blue. Uh, how do we define code blue is uh, that suddenly a person, it's an emergency situation and it may be announced in a hospital or institution in which a patient is assumed to be in a cardiopulmonary arrest. Now this announcement, uh, once it is made either verbally or on telephonically or with a press of a button, uh, this announcement prompts a team of healthcare providers, uh, which we usually call as a code team, to reach the specific location and begin the immediate resuscitation. Now, the care providers at that point of time, uh, once they have reached the uh, area of resuscitation, now their decisions are very much important and the decisions which they take within 15 to 30 minutes make the difference in the outcome of resuscitative efforts. Now, these <coughs> actions which they take are based on updated guidelines and best practices. So, life and death situation, uh, if you make correct decisions, the patient might live. If you make some wrong decisions, the patient might not live. No? So, why we should know about Code Blue? Uh, because it is our job profile. Whenever we are working in the hospital, uh, either we are looking uh, through the eyes of the assessor or we are in the team uh, which is providing these resuscitative efforts to the patient. Now, the assessor has to decide how the first responder has re reacted to the stimulated, uh, simulated code blue situation. This is the training in which we, if we keep on simulating the things, uh, we will try to improve ourselves. And the code blue situations, uh, if we come across in a simulated manner frequently, the actual patients will be saved. Now, why we have been chosen by uh, Dr. Atul uh, Kocher is that we have a, uh, ensured that all over the world, there is a standardized approach the language of resuscitation all over the world is same and all the lifesaver uh, uh, providers are on the same page. Uh, we have trained about uh, 50,000 healthcare providers in last 15 years and we have a book uh, which is basic life support and atlas based approach and all of us have contributed to this book. Uh, so uh, this book uh, the basic life support uh, and atlas based approach is available uh, on in the market uh, as well as amazon and flipkart so anyone can have this book uh, from us or from the uh, e solutions now 
we need to revisit uh, these guidelines uh, the guidelines uh, do we remember the updated guidelines and critical steps required during the code do that is uh, we have to revisit now so uh, we are what today we will be looking into the updated guidelines and critical steps uh, which we will go through in the code do situation now the we will refresh the critical points in the checklist uh, as dr sunil used to say the skills are perishable so we keep on revising our skills and once these skills are there uh, <coughs> they will not be perishable so frequently we will, will be re revisiting uh, these skills in a simulated manner so that once the actual scenario happens uh, the patients are saved the lives are saved now uh, we have to see uh, does the cardiac arrest occurs only in the admitted patients it can occur outside the hospital it can occur within the hospital the patients are not admitted certain situations are there which we will show you yeah when we were discussing and planning uh, for this presentation for the navh i asked dr rakesh and dr shakti the cardiac arrest can occur in the premises of the hospital may not be in the admitted hospital a person can be actually normal and uh, with this idea we want to share a few videos with you i think most of you have seen so this is one video with this conference room and a meeting is going on this is the punjab national bank manager and uh, it was a retirement day so audio is not coming i can hear it uh, yeah okay so the yeah, okay coming very well sir thank you so this was the gm who was giving very passionate and very emotional speech on the last day of his retirement last day of his service and suddenly he collapsed right why i'm sharing this videos with you i'll come a little later sir can we see the next video so in the here the party is going on this was in the hostel i think isn't it yeah hostel hostel, hostel yeah yeah one of the resident uh, marriage now you must have noticed here everything was normal he was dancing enjoying and suddenly he felt something and uh, he was he was uh, unconscious right why he went unconscious again we'll discuss in detail a little later can we see sir the third video this is the hospital scenario a resident doctor was on duty you must have seen all these uh, videos on your social media right So why I've shared these videos with you? In all the three videos, all the three scenarios, the person was absolutely normal a few minutes back, a few seconds back, right? And you're seeing all during at the age of 60 years at the young patient, and again around 50 to 60, they were absolutely normal doing their duty, and suddenly they collapsed, right? Now how we are going to manage? A little later. Uh, Dr. Shakti, can we start? yeah so uh, good morning everyone and thanks once again dr kocher for being with us and uh, having that much faith in us uh, i'm sure that uh, we are all going to learn at the end of uh, the session today and uh, we'll be able to uh, sort out most of the questions which are there in the mind of the people who are attending this so we'll try to see what is what exactly is uh, code blue Uh, before going into that, we must 
have uh, in our mind very clearly the philosophy of resuscitation is that when a person is about to collapse like dr smeel showed in two videos uh, first two videos you saw that the person before collapsing you know the, the the person who was giving the speech suddenly became quiet and people looked and suddenly he collapsed the person who was dancing again got some time but nobody understood the, what is coming and uh, so for healthcare providers uh, for the last 10 15 years the international guidelines say that if you could prevent cardiac arrest from happening that will be great right uh, but if the arrest occurs which we are talking about today which is the code blue how do we treat effectively how do we react how do we how do we perform in those initial few minutes as dr shakti told you that is what uh, uh, how do we do we treat effectively the person who is collapsed that is what code blue is all about so the first philosophy is try to prevent person from getting into an arrest situation but he, if he or she does then treat effectively by uh, by using the latest guidelines and whatever is there in the literature and the best of skills and another <clears> thing <throat> which uh, is uh, less commonly dealt with is support humanly with the people who come with the patients that of course is not part of the uh, of the uh, talk today so what we are doing today is the treating effectively how do we treat effectively but it is important that we do take care that the person who come with the patient their relatives or attendants are also in the loop and they are not left out and they get a huge a sudden a shock that the patient who had come in talking and uh, has suddenly collapsed so it is a it is a very uh, you know small humble request that they should also be kept in the loop when we are performing the code blue one of us uh, can spend a few seconds with the patient's relatives and attendants so that they are not caught caught unawares and we are also not maltreated because they have not been uh, taken into the loop so uh, the first thing will be when is the code blue activated in the hospital you know it is the code blue is activated by the people who are uh, absolutely on the front lines as dr kocha said in the morning and uh, uh, as soon as somebody you know usually the patient's relative will, will run to the sister or the doctor on duty and he'll say something has gone wrong with my patient can you come and have a look at the person <clears throat> so the the person who uh, uh, who the healthcare provider who goes to the patient while going towards the patient takes care that the scene is safe for him or her by just uh, tying the gown properly pulling up the <clears throat> mask and uh, uh, wearing the gloves and so on and so that you know we we all healthcare providers <clears throat> excuse me have to be extremely uh, careful that the that we do not get caught uh, by being unsafe at the time we are trying to help others the person who goes to the patient the healthcare provider then checks the responsiveness by facing the patient and tapping on the shoulder and shouting loudly uh, the name of that person and if the person is unresponsive he he or she immediately uh, presses the button usually there is a button which alerts the code code blue or there is a specified number in a hospital which is a code blue number which is dialed and the the code blue and remember the code blue is a team of doctors who are designated on that particular day to attend to all calls of for resuscitation so alerting code blue means you have alerted all those people their pagers will sound and they will be given the the location of the of the problem that has occurred right so before we uh, for, go further into what the code blue team is going to do it is in it is always important that each of our each one of us knows what are the individual skills of code blue only when all the team members of the code blue and the assessors we all of us who uh, do the checklist uh, checks of the of the code blue at various centers you know i, I feel that the people who are attending this uh, webinar uh, and all of us are extremely important links in that chain who ensure that the standard of care around the country is the same and it is of top order so uh, i i have a lot of faith and and i feel that i have we the, all of us have a lot of responsibility in in putting across these skills to you so the the skills of code blue are that 
the person, the court team itself reassesses the scene safety, reassesses the responsiveness when the person reaches that place. We'll go into the details of each one of uh, these as we go along. Then performs high quality cardiopulmonary resuscitation, which is the CPR, which has uh, three main components. Once you have assessed that the person is not breathing and doesn't have a palpable pulse, a uh, carotid pulse, goes on to high quality chest compression and opens the airway and provides breath, which again we'll be going into the details of. As soon as an AED, which is an automated external defibrillator or automatic defibrillator for, a simple, for simplicity or just a machine to give shock uh, or a defibrillator is available, it is used, which again we'll be going into the details. And then the, the advanced team joins in and it performs the advanced cardio, uh, cardiorespiratory life support as soon as possible. And as soon as they are all there and the things are available, uh, while uh, trying to get the person out of this uh, unresponsive state, which, which is called the return of spontaneous circulation or ROSC. Or once the patient achieves ROSC, the person is usually the patient is handed over to uh, post arrest for post arrest care to an ICU team. So these are the individual skills of Code Blue. And as I said, we will be going into each one of them in detail. So the first part, as you saw, was assess, reassessing scene safety and reassessing responsiveness. And thereafter, the high quality CPR, which I have told you is, has, is made up of these three components. But as I said before, going on, jumping on to the high quality CPR, we will be reassessing and maintain safety at all times. You know, at, at the moment, we are all inundated by the, the, the messages, the reports and activity and guidelines and advisories about how do we keep safe in the times of COVID and so on. But we as a team, all four of us, Dr. Atul himself and the whole team of NABH, I'm sure we have been taking care that each of the lifesaver or life supporter or our doctors or healthcare providers stay safe while managing their patient at all times. Because every year, a lot of us fall prey to this situation that we do not take care of our safety. And when we say talking about maintaining scene safety, it is taking care, care of personal protection. You know, it has, uh, the PPE has become a, 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 the, the, the in thing, the in word, the in phrase nowadays. But uh, let me share with you, and I'm sure all four of us and five of us will, uh, will, will, will be able to uh, say that and confirm that, that telling people to remain stay safe while managing the patient, the rescuer safety, we are the rescuers most of the times, luckily, but we can be the victim also at any time, but at all times, the people who are trying to rescue the patient must stay safe. And that doesn't mean PP in the terms that we, see, we are seeing it day in, day out nowadays with the PP suit and all. <clears throat> Even on a, on, a, on a daily basis, thinking that any patient can be infected, we, we, if we are managing, if we are a part of the code blue team on a, on a regular day, non-COVID day, we must be wearing our gowns while we are going towards the place from where we have got the call, we must pull up our mask. We must change our mask if depending upon the patient that we are talking about, or we, uh, uh, we don our gloves and pull our uh, caps properly. That is what is uh, meant by scene safety in code blue situations. And it can be done on the way. It should be first in our minds and then it will come into practice. And that is very important. And the, once we reach the place where the, uh, the, the patient is lying, we must ensure that the scene is safe for the victim to continue our, uh, our code blue procedures at that point of time. Right? So that is what is meant by maintaining safety at all times. Now, the next thing that we go on to is continuing with the skills of uh, high quality CPR that we, I was talking about. And to uh, discuss that with you, I'll hand you over to Anil, Dr. Anil Mister. Thank you, Dr. Rakesh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, to come to this, when we talk about or deal with a collapsed patient, we talk about a patient who's collapsed and who's lying down. So very often you will have a patient outside of the hospital situation, lying on the floor or in the hospital on the bed. So the patient is on usually a flat surface 
preferably a firm surface, right? Now to assess breathing and pulse, what we need to do is we need to look at the patient and assess the patient. So the best thing to do is to get in a position if the patient is on the floor to kneel beside the patient, right? And to kneel beside the patient, tilt your head. So put one hand on patient's head. Whenever you are on the, assessing a patient, you're going to be either on right side or the left side. And there is always going to be one hand towards the patient's head. So use that one hand to put on the forehead, tilt it gently back if there is no contraindication and tilt your head and look at the chest and the abdomen to see whether it is rising and falling, right? At the same time, with the other hand, feel for the thyroid cartilage or the most prominent part of the front of the neck. Pull your finger towards you, like I said, on your side of the neck, between the muscle on the side, which is usually the sternocleidomastoid and the trachea. Press gently and feel for the pulse. Now, so the, you're two, doing two things simultaneously. You're trying to feel for the pulse and you've got your head tilted and you're trying to look for a rise and fall of the chest rhythmically. Now, how long are we going to do this? Not less than five seconds and not more than 10 seconds. The reasons are very simple. You don't want to miss out on something which is happening and spend too little time. And you don't want to waste too much time trying to just assess without actually going into action and doing something about this, right? Now, how do we know how much time has elapsed or the uh, seconds have elapsed? So the best thing to do is count 1001, 1002, 1003. So you can do it in English, you can do it in Hindi or in your own language. The idea of adding that word 1000 is to ensure that you do not count too fast and miss out on the time factor, right? The next thing is once you have assessed that the patient is not breathing and the patient does not have pulse, it is time to get into action. And the thing that you're going to do is start doing a good quality chest compressions. That is the first thing to be started. Now, how do we start chest compressions? So if you move on to the next slide, try and expose the patient's chest. The reason is very simple. You need to be able to identify the area where you're going to do the compressions. And that area usually lies between the two nipples of the patient. Okay, so if you expose the chest, you can draw an imaginary line between the two nipples. And at the center of this is the sternum, which is where the compressions have to be done. Now, once you've identified the area, place the heel of any one hand, hand of your preference, the heel of the hand on the sternum, right? Put the other hand on top of the lower hand, open out the fingers of the lower hand and interlace your fingers and keep the fingers of the lower hand away from the chest. Okay, so that when you apply compression, you do not end up applying pressure on the ribs. Third thing to do now is how do you position yourself? So above the hand, go to the elbows. The elbows should be locked so that your arms are not bent, right? Move further up and look at the shoulders. So if you look at this picture, the shoulders are directly on top of the hands. Now in a picture, it is easy to appreciate this, but when you are doing this yourself, how would you know that your shoulders are right on top of the hands? It's a very simple, day-to-day uh, -day life experience that you're going to utilize here. All of you have at some point or the other in your life tried to close an overstuffed suitcase and you use your hands and you shift your weight forward till you feel all your weight is falling on the suitcase. This is exactly what has to be done except that the hands are here together. Move your weight forward till you feel all your weight is falling directly on the chest. That would be the correct position. Right? So you have positioned yourself, your hands are in position, your elbows are in position, and your shoulders are in position, you're ready to start the compression. Now there are four very important things about compression. So the key words are push hard, push fast, allow complete recoil, and minimize interruptions. Now let me explain this very quickly. When you say push fast, it means you push at the compression rate of about 100 to 120 compressions per minute. All right but you do not carry on doing all the compressions in one go. In one go, you're going to do 30 compressions at the rate of 100 to 120 compressions per minute. Now, if you do it, the compression at this rate, it usually takes about 15 to 18 seconds to complete 30 compressions. How do you keep a count? So while you're compressing, just keep counting one, two, three, four, five, you drop the 1000 here, all right? So that will give you the rate. The second thing is just how much do you push? Push hard. And when you say push hard in an adult, you push the sternum down by two inches or five centimeters. All right. But at no time you should push down more than two and a half inches. 
All right. Now we have in the present day feedback devices which are kept on the sternum and you push on top of it. That is, is uh, interposed between the hand and the sternum and you apply the pressure on top of that. Now these feedback devices actually tell you whether you're pushing to the right depth or not. If you're pushing too little, it will tell you too little. If you're pushing too much, it will tell you that you're pushing too much. So those are very useful devices. So you push hard, push fast there. Dr. Akesh is showing this to you. Yes. Uh, just take a look. So this is the flat device which is kept on the chest and you put the hand instead of directly on the sternum on top of this device. All right. And you do the compressions and the pressure is transmitted through this device onto the sternum. All right. I hope you understand that. Right. So you've pushed hard, you push fast. Now, third thing is allow complete recoil of the chest wall. When you're squeezing the heart, you push the blood out. Then you have to take your weight off to allow it to refill so that when the next push comes in, you are able to push a decent amount of blood again into the circulation. What is important here is to remember that even a good quality chest compression pushes out only about one third of normal cardiac output. So no compromises here. Allow it to fill nicely, allow it to be squeezed nicely. All right. So allow full chest compression. And when we talk about minimizing interruptions, we are talking about interruptions in chest compression. And where do they come in? If the patient is not breathing and the patient is not having any pulse, you're going to give compressions as well as breaths. So when you stop compression, then give breaths and come back to compressions, that time span should not exceed 10 seconds. Right. So this is to minimize chest compressions, uh, the interruption in chest compression. Now I'd like you to See all these features in this little video that we have for you. Observe closely, please. Right? The chest is being exposed. The hands have been placed in the intermammary line. Look at the position of the hands. Look at the position of the elbow. All right? Shoulders right on top. And a good rhythmic movement of the hips. It's actually a rocking movement. All right? And at one point of time, they used to say, uh, if you can remember the song Staying Alive, in your head and you sing it and you do your compressions to that beat, you will get a chest compression rate of 100 per minute, right? I think there's a bit of an interruption happening here. Look at this again. I thought you, you were going to sing it with it. <laughs> <laughs> no, difficult to keep rhythm because there, are, uh, there is an interruption in this. But I think you realize, so you can all choose your own song and sing that song in the head while you do the chest compression. This like walking to music and one doesn't get tired easy. All right, so chest compressions, 30 compressions like this, and you pull your hands off, right? Now, after you've given 30 compressions, it is time to give breaths. What is important to remember here is to give breaths, you have to have the patient's airway open. How do you open the patient's airway? It's a very, very simple method. No special techniques. The procedure is called head tilt and chin lift. Remember, you had kept one hand on the forehead right in the beginning when you're checking the pulse. So you take the hand back into that position, all right? Take the other hand, hook your index and middle finger and hook it under the bony part of the chin. Now tilt the head back with the hand on the forehead and bring the chin forward. In this case, if you look at it, bring it up with the hooked fingers, all right? Now when you do this, the airway which was closed, this is just like a situation where a person snores, the tongue falls back, epiglottis falls back. When you do this, the person stops snoring, which means the airway is open. So now, they look at their fingers, which is hooking the hooking under the bony part of the chin. It is pulling the chin forward and tilting the head bob backwards. So if you notice the, the jaw and the front of the neck has become stretched. All right. This will open up the airway. Okay. Next thing is now the airway is open to give breaths. There are several methods of giving breaths, but we will just talk about the basic principles right now. When you give breaths during a cardiac arrest situation, after 30 compressions, what is recommended is you give two breaths, which means two inspirations and two expirations. Now, it is very clear that the inspiration should not be very long nor very short. So one second each. And how do you know it's one second? You count in your head, you say 1001 and you give a breath. All right. And then allow the breath to come out for another one second. Okay. So you do such two such cycles. Now you might have in the, inside the hospital, you may have an oxygen, you may not have an oxygen. What is important to remember is that irrespective of whether there is oxygen or not, the duration of inspiration remains one second. All right. Okay. Now, how do you know that your breath has been delivered? So when you tilt your head, you can look at a visible rise of the chest. The chest should rise and the chest should fall with your breaths, inspiration and expiration. That will tell you whether your breath has been effective, right? 
Now you might have a situation where you have given a breath and the chest hasn't raised. Raised. Now what that means is that there might still be an obstruction, or the seal that you have made to give a breath is not adequate. So you reposition the head again and try and give another breath. All right. The second scenario is the second breath goes or the second breath doesn't go. In either event, you don't waste time on trying to give a third breath. You go immediately back to compression. So now this cycle should not take more than 10 seconds. So within 10 seconds, you complete these two attempts at giving breaths and go back to chest compression. Okay. Now in a hospital situation, and particularly now that uh, uh, we, we're talking about a code blue team, the best method or the simplest method available inside the hospital is what we usually know as an AMBU bag, which is actually a trade name, but it's a bag mask device. You can see Dr. Rakesh is holding up for you. This is a bag with a mask attached to the front of the bag. So it's called a bag mask device. This is the best method or the recommended method to give breaths. If, however, you're outside the hospital, you would not have a bag mask with you. However, you can have as a healthcare provider, a device called a pocket mask. Now, this is a pocket mask which Dr. Rakesh is showing you. It comes inside a case. It's a triangular structure. It is usually collapsed. You open the box and you, you take out the mask. Way. Yeah, we will show it to you again. But this is something which can be carried easily. And I've actually carried it in my pocket on occasions. And I always carry it in my bag. So do the rest of us. Okay. So inside the hospital bag mask, outside the hospital, mask to mask. So we'll talk about a little uh, talk about a uh, bag mask device. You can see very clearly that there is one bag on one side and a mask on the other side. Now this bag is self inflating. It is open at both ends. One end, the air goes in the other end, the air goes out and the mask is fitted at the end where the air goes out. All right. So every time you squeeze it, it reinflates. Okay. So this is called a self inflating bag. Now, how do you give breaths with a bag mask device? The person who has to give breaths has to position himself or herself at the head end of the patient. All right. And then place the mask over the victim's nose and mouth. The mask will cover both nose and mouth. And how do you hold the mask in place? Now, what is some, this is something which you can see very clearly. The thumb and index finger of the hand, which is holding a mask form a C. All right. Now you hold the mask with that C and with the C, remember you can compress the mask on the face. All right. Now you're left with the other three fingers which form an E. Now these three fingers which are forming an E go on to the bony part of the jaw on the side or the mandibular ramus as you know scientifically. Okay, so you have an E and C grip on the mask. The mask makes a seal. With C you compress the mask on the face and with E now you're going to elevate the jaw. The reason is with elevation of jaw the airway is going to open. All right. Now tilt the head. So this is what you have done. You've not done a head tilt chin lift with one hand with the C and E. All right. So the airway is now open. The seal is made. And with the other hand in which you're holding the bag, you're ready to deliver a breath. And you use the same principles to deliver a breath. You squeeze the bag for one second. You squeeze the bag enough to look only for a visible chest rise, not too much. It is easy to get excited when the chest rise is happening. All right. And deliver too much breath which is not necessarily a good thing as you can see in this video. I hope we are able to run this here. Look at this. All right. Look at the lungs inflating, but there is something else inflating below the lungs. You can recognize it easily as a stomach. And this is happening because look at the bag. The bag is being squeezed too much. All right. So when you squeeze the bag too much, the air not only goes into the lung, but it tends to go into the stomach and it can lead to regurgitation. So just a visible chest rise is all that is required. Okay. Right. And now to get back to the cycle. So we are in a situation where a patient has had a cardiorespiratory arrest, which means he has no carotid pulse and he has no respiration. So you started cycles of CPR, right? So very quickly, code blue has been activated. The team has rushed. It has reassessed the scene safety. After reassessing the scene safety, it has to reassess the responsiveness. The patient might have recovered. All right. If the patient is still not recovered, then they check the pulse and breathing for five to 10 seconds. If there is no breathing and there's no circulation, remember to start with chest compression first. So 30 compressions followed by opening of the airway, giving two breaths, 
and then going back to 30 compressions. All right. So this cycle continues. All right. Two breaths and 30 compressions. The question is now, how long does one continue? All right. You continue it till patient shows some signs of return of spontaneous circulation, which would be that the patient starts breathing, patients start moving, groaning, etc., etc. All right. Now, if there are two people, how do you carry on with uh, improve of a good efficiency of the team? So the roles get divided. So the person who is doing the hard work, that is chest compression, will after five cycles or five compressions of 30, uh, five cycles of 30 compression and two breaths will go on to giving breaths. And the person who was giving breaths will now start doing chest compression. How do we do it? Now look at these two, identify these two rescuers. Person A is doing chest compression and person B is giving breaths, right? After five cycles of 30 compression and two breaths have been completed, the person A has now started assessing for signs of circulation now because he's free. He can check the carotid pulse. So he's checking the carotid pulse. It is not mandatory, but it is, it is something which can be done easily. He can make good use of his time. So he's looking for carotid pulse to see whether the spontaneous circulation has returned or not. And the person B, after giving the fifth cycle of breaths, that quickly leaves the bag aside and moves to the new position on the side of the victim and starts, starts chest compression. The person A now moves to the head end, picks up the bag, and now this person is ready to give breaths. So because the compressions have to always start first, so the person who's to start compression always moves first. And the person who has to give breaths then replaces the person. So this cycle of switching between A and B after every five cycles of 30 compression and two breaths will continue. Dr. Sunil, yeah. uh, yeah. it's time to go on to the next step, please. Okay. Thank you. So as uh, Dr. Mishra has said, with the best of the compressions, best of the cardiac compressions and the breathing, you can uh, take care of the cardiac output only by 30%. Now, what to do about the rest? The rest of the because normally it has to be near 100%. Uh, sir, okay. Dr. Sunil, sir, there's a small request from uh, people that if you could speak a little louder. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll repeat. As uh, Dr. Mishra, is it audible now? Is it all right? Sir, Kocha, is it uh, all right? Yes, sir, I think so. Uh, I think okay. yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. On your laptop also, you can increase the volume sometimes. I think it's the maximum. Okay. It's maximum. I think it will be fine now that you are holding it close to your... Correct, sir. Yeah. Yeah, as uh, Dr. Mishra said, with the best of the cardiac compressions and giving breaths, you can uh, take care of only 30% of the cardiac output. How to bring it to near normal? That's 100%, right? So before we discuss that, let's understand what happened in the sudden cardiac arrest of video which I showed you, right? This is a normal heart. Uh, sir, can we see the video? Yeah, which is normally breathing, absolute, all right, lapped up, lapped up, lapped up. And suddenly something happens. It has started fibrillating. So when the heart starts fibrillating, it is consuming the ATPs and uh, no cardiac output. So after a few seconds, what happens? The whole of the ATPs are gone and heart becomes absolutely straight line, no cardiac activity. So with the, left, with the result, the person collapses. That's what happened in all the three cases which we showed you before. Now, how to take care of this, right? If we are the outside hospital condition or inside the hospital condition, inside the hospital, we have got the manual defibrillator. We have the people get this condition known as ventricular fibrillation. There are experts, there are advanced life providers who can diagnose the uh, ventricular fibrillation and take care of that, right? But in a situation which is outside the hospital or in the hospital where the person are not expert, so we have to have a device which decides whether the heart is having fibrillation or not. Because in 84% of the cases of sudden cardiac arrest, this fibrillation is the cause. In rest 16% of the cases, this is not the cause. So to take care of these 84% cases, a device has to be there, which is automated. This automated means every process is automatic. External means we uh, apply the pads over the body. Defibrillator means it gives a shock automatically, right? So can you see the next sir? Yeah. Now it delivers a maximum amount of electrical energy over a few milliseconds, right? The heart is fibrillating. 
and uh, when we give the energy from outside it becomes totally stunts absolutely straight line so if you are giving good quality cpr after that it assumes the normal activity will come back right this is the principle of using defibrillation giving shock or the aed now there has to how we do how we know that uh, and chances of success drops every few minutes because it is consuming the atp so this has to be used asap that is as soon as possible right now how we do know how we know that uh, the cause is the ventricular fibrillation or some other causes right so there has to be connection between the device and the patient right so what are the operations of the ad what are the steps the first of all switch on the machine right this is totally automated so as soon as you switch on the machine and follow the prompts and just follow what the machine says right and this is power on after having the power on the machine the next uh, step is the prompt says apply pads to the patient bare chest right so we apply pads while the cardiac compression is going on because as dr mishra said there has to be a minimum interruption right after the pads where the pads have to be attached it is all depicted on the pads where they have to be put right so as soon as the pads are attached the machine will automatically analyze the rhythm whether it is shockable rhythm or non shockable rhythm at that time when the machine is analyzing you have to be little away from the patient right because otherwise when you do doing the cardiac compression the machine may think that it is a ventricular fibrillation where it is uh, the straight line right and after the machine has analyzed it normally takes approximately 10 seconds to analyze a good machine after that if the machine says that okay it is uh, the shock is required just press the button right and uh, after again you have to be away from the patient because that you may can get the shock so as soon as the shock is delivered with the machine will automatically deliver start the cardiac compression again give the five cycles of 30 compression and two breaths that approximately takes 2 minutes and after that again the machine will automatically say analyzing the rhythm and whether shockable or non shockable so when as soon as the ad arrives it checks for the rhythm if they say shockable when shock is delivered one shock is delivered and you resume cpr and give five cycles of uh, cpr good quality cpr right and again analyze the rhythm we can go back to the uh, check rhythm right it was a non shockable one which approximately is there in 16% of the cases of uh, sudden cardiac arrest you resume cpr immediately the five cycles check rhythm after five cycles because initially the rhythm may be non shockable but after good quality cpr the rhythm can be converted into shockable as you probably i am uh, able to highlight a shockable rhythm is much better than the non shockable rhythm because it is the causes of ventricular fibrillation you are given the shock the first shock usually converts approximately 95% cases of ventricular fibrillation into the normal sinus rhythm so that is the importance of the aed and aed the shock has to be given as early as possible usually within the 3 minutes because after that atp is consumed and it becomes a non shock do you want me to show the aed yeah yeah so i am not able to see the screen you can uh, probably uh, demonstrate you can't see the screen no i can't see i can't see so you can demonstrate sir take a few minutes to see so this is the ad one of the ad machines which is there there is an on off button out here as soon as you press this button unit okay stay calm check responsiveness call for help attach defib pads to patient's bare chest so the these pads as dr sunil has told you are to be attached onto the patient chest at, at pad the position which are shown on the pads themselves i can't show because it will slide down on the mannequin which is right behind me but attached once once you have attached the pads don't touch it will say this don't touch patient analyzing shock advised don't touch patient press flashing shock button i hope you can see the flashing shock button this one so press this shock delivered start cpr 
now you can hear the metronome which will guide you as to how many compressions are to be given at at what rate right so this is the functioning of uh, ad in short dr sunil is that fine yeah so i'm not able to see so what i heard is perfect sir dr pocha will be able to tell in better way because he is able to see sir so uh, we can dr. clear dr. see if you can just adjust your setting na dr sunil sir Uh, i think the, you can open that grid so uh, you will have picture in picture there i am able to see you i am able to see dr mishra that is all the maybe okay. and, and the next uh, you, i think he has to he has to go on the, uh, uh, the yeah. that there are two modes which are there uh, okay sir it's all right it's all right it's all right we can uh, continue you can see more than four people uh, okay sir we can continue anyway so so, uh, so i th i think uh, it uh, reminds us of the a very important personality our uh, ex president who was perfectly all right giving a speech and he collapsed the normal reaction is take the patient immediately to the hospital and by the time when reach the hospital usually the response is dark sub late like i think it's a little late right so best thing is let the hospital come to you If in the even hospital condition or outside the hospital condition, start CPR, good quality CPR immediately, so that it maintains the ATPs. And as soon as the AD or the defibrillator comes, use it. Am I right, sir? I I think, Doctor Sunil, uh, you can share your experience that the OPD block has uh, five ADs installed mm -hmm. in our hospital uh, yeah. at uh, five floors, and because there is a footfall of more than seven eight thousand people out there. they are within the hospital premises but yet not in the wards so no. there the ad is a great help and yes. uh, all the airports a few metro stations duranto express uh, aircrafts so many places and our friends our assessors our seniors who are attending this uh, webinar they must have all been there they must have faced such situations uh, and <coughs> once they know how to use it how simple it is i'm yes. sure that each one of us can matter to one life in our lifetime and that's absolutely as an important lives have been saved it has been on record and there in medical college they saved one person who collapses collapsed at the gate of the hospital and the team rushed with the ad there right and given a shock the patient there was a recovery there was spontaneous circulation and the patient went into the ccu they did the angiography and all that and the patient discharge of nine i think in 15 16 years that is the first incidence where we heard that the ad was used just outside the hospital and it actually ended up in a neurologically intact uh, old person he was around 60 yes. plus person you know uh, yes so because the window time window is very small if ad has to be used it has to be used in first few minutes after that is too late after the it becomes the stents and whole atp is consumed do you cannot do anything right yes, except yes. and a good quality cpr of course okay. it has to start as early as possible so do we go to the next slide ah, yeah dr shakti can you tell us something uh, about it i yeah. can uh, uh, remember uh, the incidents which was uh, quoted widely in the press uh, that the president of the american heart association uh, who was a cardiologist uh, he had a sudden arrest at 6 am in the hotel uh, during a conference Uh, and uh, there was his uh, uh, daughter who tried to resuscitate him and ad was available in the hotel and it was immediately available to them uh, within 3 <laughs> minutes uh, the ad was applied and he was successfully resuscitated and uh, all intact uh, so that is one uh, thing which is uh, certain that the ad's can save uh, the patients more ad's at more places are available more lives will be saved and as soon as we apply the ad the chances of survival keep on decreasing uh, if you do not apply say uh, every 7 to 10% chances decrease every minute so if you do not apply ad for say 5 minutes the chances are that only 50% of the patients will be revived yeah, so that is just i wanted to say the example that i have is the the person our friend my classmate who a collapsed uh, at the uh, just close to the uh, one of the cardiac centers in delhi and uh, by the time he received his first shock and mind you the rhythm was a uh, a uh, shockable rhythm it was 18 minutes but uh, the, even that could not help because as dr shakti is saying in the absence of good cpr 
every minute the chances go down by 7% and in the presence of a good cpr they go down by 4 or 5% isn't it yeah oh. I think uh, Dr. Sunil can uh, uh, summarize the special features at the special age groups and other conditions. Right, Sunil? The Dr. Shakti is expert in that, sir. Okay. So, uh, we, uh, we use AD in all age groups. Uh, we take adult uh, age, uh, person who is more than 8 years of age. Uh, if the person is uh, 0 to uh, 8 years, we take it as a child. In a child, we preferably use child pads uh, and child system. Uh, in an infant, we may use a child pad, we may use adult pads also, uh, and whatever is available. But remember that the child system with child pads cannot be used in, in an adult, but adult system and adult pads can be used in a child. But you have to see that the pads do not overlap. So best thing is when you are putting pads in a child or an infant, you can put one in the front of the chest and another in the back of the chest. So, so that the heart gets interposed between the two pads. The idea is that the current should flow through the heart. Now, I think, Doctor, you can talk about the hairy chest and wet chest and other yeah. medical patches and uh, other things as well. And there are there are uh, victims uh, who have. Uh, hairy chest. Now, if there is a hairy chest, the pads uh, don't uh, fix properly. So what you can do is that sometimes a razor is available uh, in the AD kit. You can clean the, shave on the only the part where the pads are to be stuck uh, quickly. You can shave that and put the pads. If there is no razor, usually two sets of pads are available. You can put one set of pads forcefully remove that pad and which lots of hairs will also come out and then you can put a second set of pads. So that way the hairy chest uh, is taken care of. Now, there may be some situations when the victim is lying in the water. Maybe if the patient has had drowning and he is just out of it. He has uh, an arrest which is a shockable rhythm. In that condition, you have to just uh, wipe off the front of the chest. Don't wipe out everything. Just front of the chest can be wiped and you can put the pads at that point. Of time. This uh, water can also be there. Suppose the patient has an acute uh, myocardial infarction or uh, ST elevated myocardial infarction. He has a lot of perspiration. So that will also cause a lot of wetness on the chest. So only the front part of the chest can be uh, wiped out the area where the pads are to be stuck. So that is cleaned and then you can apply the pads and then go usual as the as Dr. Sunil has already told you. Then there can be uh, situations where the patient has an implanted defibrillator which is which will be looking like a about one to two centimeter bulge on the chest. Usually it is on the right side or on the left side. Now you have to avoid this bulge and put pads about two to three centimeters away from that. If it is an internal defibrillator, internal defibrillator might be working. You might be seeing some twitchings on the skin on that part of the bulge. Let the internal defibrillator work if it is working and then you can use the AD afterwards. But if it is not working, you can use the AD straight away. Then some people are using the uh, patches. Maybe somebody is using a uh, nitroglycerin patch or somebody is using uh, analgesic patches. So if that falls within your area of the pad, then you can remove those uh, patches, wipe out the area, and then you can put the pads. So these are some of the uh, situations uh, in which uh, we have to use the AD carefully. So, Dr. Shakti, not only the aid is important, but uh, probably proper training in the use of aid is also required. And that, I think, not more than half an hour, the training? Yeah, some, some training uh, is required. And, and aid is very uh, simple to use. Uh, what you can do is uh, take it as your spouse. If you don't follow it, they will continue to say, Okay, yes, continue to do this job. You have not done this. You have not done this. So unless you do that job, 
the ad will continue to say uh, yes do this do this do this uh, follow follow the prompts of the ad religiously and uh, i'm sure that the patients will be saved yes sir so uh, dr shakti you were to discuss the yeah uh, then there are situation. some uh, more code blue situations uh, in which uh, the code blue is activated the patient was unresponsive the code blue is activated you have reassessed the scene safety you have reassessed the responsiveness and you have assessed the breathing and pulse now you have found that patient is unresponsive but he has normal breathing and has a pulse now in this situation this can be found if the patient has drug overdose the patient is unresponsive but he is breathing normally normal breathing means that the patient has normal breathing any abnormal breathing we will take it as an absent breathing now this fresh person has normal breathing and pulse so we have to put him in a recovery position now this recovery position is uh, the left lateral or right lateral position whatever you feel like now in this photograph if you see that the head is tilted a little back the head is supported on the upper hand of the victim the lower hand is at a rectangle which is making the patient not prone you know and the bent arms are giving it a stability now the upper part leg is bent so that the patient does not become fully prone and the lower leg is straightened now this is the position which we used to do sometimes after the tonsillectomy also so that any secretions when you see any secretions will come out through the angle of the mouth the trachea is above the angle of the mouth so all secretions will trickle down through the angle of the mouth and the patient's airway will be maintained now we can check breathing every 2 minutes any time the patient has uh, stopped breathing or has no pulse we can just straighten the patient and what dr misra has already told you the chest compression we can start now there can be situation also when breathing is absent but circulation is present uh, this you will frequently find in icus where the patients are on ventilator we are supporting patients the breathing but patient circulation is intact hai na so what we have to do we have to just support the breathing so give breath which is at the rate of 10 to 12 breaths per minute and monitor continue to monitor circulation every 2 minutes now these are the special situations now we have a word about out of hospital situations hai na these are the situations which were in the hospital then we have some situations which are out of the hospital now if you are a lone rescuer ensure that the scene safety is there you have to always ensure scene safety as dr rakesh has earlier told you that scene safety is one part which you always always maintain then after that assess the responsiveness as soon as possible and make an emergency call if the patient is unresponsive then you assess the breathing and pulse within 5 to 10 second it should not be less than 5 seconds and not more than 10 seconds once the breathing and circulation is absent you give 30 chest compressions and you have to decide at this point of time whether you want to give breast to the patient or not if you are want to give breast to the patient then you open the airway and give two breaths using a pocket mask now if you are not comfortable in giving breast to the patient and you are a lone rescuer outside the hospital you can continue to give chest compressions without giving breaths this is an outside the hospital situation if you do not want to give breaths you continue to give chest compressions and the chest compressions rate is 100 to 120 per minute that means you will continue to give about 200 to 240 compressions in 2 minutes and then only you will check 
the science of circulation. Now, once you have seen, uh, you have started giving, trying to give breaths using pocket mask. You have to use a barrier device and pocket mask is a good barrier device, which is available. Now, it is opened like a jewelry box and it has contents which have a spirit swab, a pair of gloves and a pocket mask. It is easier to assemble. When the pocket mask is there, it, you can see the white structure, which is a hydrophilic. It doesn't allow the secretions to come to the rescuer. Now you push that area and it will open up and tell you that it is a, uh, it has opened like a pocket mask. Now, now you can put a unidirectional valve. This will, the valve will fit only in one direction and this will be a unidirectional valve, uh, which will give breath to the patient, but the patient's expired breaths will not come to you. This is a safety device and a barrier device. Now, how do you use a pocket mask? It's a triangular structure. The triangle, the apex of the triangle will go to the glabula or to the bridge of the nose. And the base will come to the chin. Now, how to hold it? You have done the head tilt and chin lift earlier. Now the thumb and the index finger were free. You make a V, inverted V, and make a tight seal over the V part of the mask. That is the apex. And the chin, you use two fingers, and the thumb of the other hand goes to the pocket mask and makes a tight seal below. And then you are able to head tilt and chin lift and give two breaths. So this is how you use a pocket mask. We will show you how uh, the pocket mask works. So made a V and thumb down and give two breaths. One second inspiration, one second expiration and again one second inspiration. So this is how we are using pocket mask. So if you are a healthcare provider, I think you should have a pocket mask in with you. You can keep it in your bag. You can keep it in your pocket, which can be readily used. It's a very small uh, pocket mask, which can be used as Dr. Akesh is showing you. Now, this was a situation uh, when myself, uh, Dr. Sunil, Dr. Misra were uh, walking in the uh, Malan Azad Medical College, uh, our lawns, front lawns. And uh, Dr. Misra had uh, was talking. He's a very talkative person. Dr. we shot it for the Delhi Doodarshan. Yeah. We shot this video. Yeah? We simulated the situation. He simulated the situation for uh, Doodarshan. And uh, you'll see uh, how Dr. Misra has uh, acted beautifully. As Dr. Atul was saying in the morning. Yeah, absolutely. Atul was saying that he's a very good. Uh, and uh, this uh, is the uh, just on the dean's carpet, as we call yes. it, sir. At yeah, the dean's carpet. Carpet. And we can see the yeah. Mamsky gate uh, behind you. Yeah. Yes. And uh, this uh, video always reminds me that the people who are walking around, none of them actually came to help. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so let us look at the video. So. Uh, does this have an audio also, sir? Hmm? No. No, okay. So he felt li little uneasy and collapsed. So we gently lowered him to the ground, checked for the scene safety, everything is safe. The people are walking around, nobody is uh, bothered. Checked for the responsiveness and called for help. So Dr. Akesh dialed the casualty emergency of Loknak Hospital. Uh, we checked for the pulse and breathing simultaneously. And since there was no pulse, we started with the chest compression. So in the meantime, Dr. Akesh uh, had a pocket mask, which was given to me and two breaths were given. You can see the uh, rise in chest and again 30 compressions are given. 
mean time the ambulance from loknayak hospital has come and dr sunil has brought the ad so while he is uh, uh, opening the ad uh, we'll continue with the chest compressions okay till the pads are applied i think this video beautifully highlights that uh, minimizing interruptions at all times in chest compression uh, the importance of scene safety whatever way it can be done even in the field we were talking about within the hospital but outside as well and uh, using the ad as soon as it is available on the site no doubt is any yes absolutely so uh, and so start the good quality cpr asap as, as early as possible and call for so, the help so so lives can be saved by using an ad and good quality chest compression so having uh, completed the the basic life support the part of code blue let us uh, in short discuss about the advanced life support uh, limb of the code blue because the code blue starts with a small team coming in and starting with the basic life support steps keeping in mind that the scene is safe for everybody as the advanced team joins in with the code cart which can have as dr smeel has uh, talked about manual defibrillators drugs fluids iv fluids etc uh, the the team joins in and uh, an advanced assessment and management of the patient is now carried out the pls is continuing at the main at the same time the code team is the team on duty on that particular day and when the code blue is sounded they come in and at the same time the code cart which carries the basic and advanced assessment and management things are are brought to the site where the patient is being uh, resuscitated uh, 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 the the way the outcomes of the uh, of the other uh, victims uh, Uh, problems uh, is totally dependent upon how the team works and we have realized that the 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 better the team uh, gels the better the team knows each other's steps the better the team knows each uh, level of the skill uh, the better they perform and of course uh, on on a particular day uh, one of the persons one of the team members becomes the team coordinator rather than using the term leader we use the term coordinator because that person on that particular day and again it is irrespective of the of the level of uh, seniority of a person the first life saver the first life support team member who reaches the site uh, he or she should be the team coordinator on that particular day so the team coordinator does the first thing he takes he or she takes care and before i go any further i must tell you that an ideal team is of six people but uh, at least three people have to be there to conduct an advanced code right so if the coordinator does the first thing he takes care that the all the team members are safe they have taken care of their personal protection and at that time uh, he uh, or she analyzes or checks the responsiveness of the patient makes the initial assessment and then because everything is available now at uh, that site uh, starts giving the role allocating the roles to the team members the first person is sent as we were doing a uh, call for help and aid there where here also he tells the first member of his team go go and get the code cart attach all the monitors to the patient and tell me the condition uh, of the patient tell me the vitals of the patient tell me the parameters which you find so the first person gets the code cart and starts attaching the monitors and uh, all the equipment on the patient while this is being done the second person is immediately sent to assess the pulse of the patient the carotid pulse and if the pulse is not there start with a high quality chest compression as we have been talking about so the second person because we are code blue we are we are already presuming that the patient is in cardio respiratory arrest that is what uh, the code blue is for the second member will go and check the pulse and will reassess the pulse and will start chest compression there after after checking for the pulse that ensuring that at 5 to 10, 10 seconds that there is no pulse start with the chest compression the next uh, member of the team is sent to the head end of the patient to open the airway and start giving breaths and if the oxygen is there connect that oxygen to the patient while all this is being done 
the, the, the person with the monitor and court card, defibrillator or AED, whatever, is bringing the things and attaching it on the patient. If we have more rescuers, then the next rescuer will put up an IV line, will draw the samples depending upon what we are thinking in terms of the diagnosis, why the patient is in cardiac arrest, and uh, manage the drugs and fluids thereafter as the code is being run. And if we have six persons, which is an ideal situation, the sixth person takes care of the, of the records which of, of all the activities which is happening here. And uh, you can see the, the arrangement of six people. The coordinator has moved to the head, foot end of the patient from where he or she can easily, uh, easily see all the activity which is going on and can address each one of the team members. At the same time, the record keeper, the M5, is close to uh, the, the coordinator. This person can be also at the head end. And the two are the ones who take an overview of the situation and keep on recording the M5 keeps on recording while the others are doing their activity. And at this point of time, for a team to work prep properly, as, a, as we say, as a well-oiled machine, it is important that each one of them knows the, the various elements which are very important, which form the team. You, know, you say this is a formidable team. You know, Individually, they are not that good you know, players. But when they blend as a team, they, they are unbeatable. They are world beaters. So similarly, the resuscitation team should be such that they know the elements of uh, team dynamics and they actually live those team dynamics, to set, so to say. The roles, uh, so these dynamics can be divided into roles, into what to communicate and then how to communicate. So these eight team dynamics are applicable to any sphere of life where you are working as a team especially when you are working with your peers. When you are working with two, you are uh, the people who are too much senior to them, you, to you, then you tend to listen to them. If you have too many juniors, you feel that they will listen to you. But the team is one where it doesn't matter which level of seniority you have, yes. and, but you are following the team dynamics. So the roles, as I said, which are there in a team are clear roles and responsibilities. That means what role is, whichever role is allotted to you. Dr. Shakti is the coordinator of, the, of this web, webinar. So he's, he was the one who allotted us that this is your role and this is your role. And at the same time, so uh, there, there has been constructive intervention in the, these roles. So whatever role is assigned to you, you must understand that role and say that, yes, I am going to do this role and I'll put all my mind, heart, soul into the role which is given to me. The team coordinator also has to understand which person of his team will be the best suited for a particular role. So accordingly, he or she should assign the roles. And then the person who is being assigned the role should know that this role is not the one he, which he or she does very well. So he should be without shame, immediately share it with the team coordinator that, okay, this is something which I'm not very comfortable with. Can you assign me some other role? At the same time, you know, the team leader sometimes may be leading a, a, a situation where he has, he himself or she himself doesn't feel comfortable. You know, a, a, a code which you have never done. You know, you, and Sunil has done, let us say. So I'll say, Sunil, can you lead this code and tell me what to do? So I get a great chance to learn from the best person at that point of time. It is not just because I am the senior most or I am the first person who has seen the patient for the first time. I have to lead the core, you know. So this knowing your limitations and without any shame, accepting it saves the lives, you know. So know your limitations and admit them so that you can be assigned a different role or you assign another person as the team coordinator. And constructive intervention is something where irrespective of the, the, the level of your colleagues who are doing something which can harm the patient, you must intervene. And in a, in a manner which is very subtle, very comfortable to the person, rather than be accusing, you know, you don't know this, you don't know that, like this. This is very often seen on code blues. But if the person says that, uh, you know, we are dealing with an adult patient, are we giving the right dose? So this gives a chance to the person to rethink his or her strategy and say that, okay, okay, good, you told me. And we, we basically the idea is not to harm the patient. 
so all these roles are meant in that manner so these are the roles clear roles and so understand your role if you can't do that role uh, withdraw quickly and go to the role which you can do well and if some any one of your team members is going to make or take a step which can harm the patient you have to stop him there in such a nice manner that he or she understands that you wanted to warn him and tell him that something is going amiss or going wrong then what to communicate you know during the process one is the roles that we have done once the roles are are, are done we are doing our job then what to communicate from time to time from time to time we must share our knowledge that means the the team coordinator should loudly say that okay we are in such a situation are we missing anything do you have any good ideas are we so what what it does you know it it allows every team member to start feeling a part that he himself or she herself is leading the team okay whatever findings come to their mind they can share loudly so that every team member understands you know a person who is doing a chest compression suddenly finds the chest full of hurting area he or she has to immediately tell the team coordinator you know there is the chest is full of hurting area are we dealing with an anaphylaxis great good you told me so this is what is knowledge sharing also re evaluation summarizing every 2 minutes every 2 minutes the team the, the the recorder or the team coordinator if there is no recorder the team coordinator kind of revises the whole steps that have been happening till that time so that everybody as we said in the beginning is on the same page you know the language of resuscitation which dr shakti talked about and similarly if a new person joins the team he or she should know that we are 8 minutes into code blue and this is what has happened now can you take as a role as a recorder okay good so he or she makes a small summary of what has been told to her and after that she starts building up on that story so that is what is re evaluation and summarizing and then finally how to communicate how to talk to each other when we are in a in a meeting in a in a core code blue the message which we want to give should be clear you know i want to tell dr shakti can i take the next slide uh, and do that so i should be looking at dr shakti i should uh, communicate with him uh, preferably by his first name and respectfully but the message should be loud it should be clear it should not be mumbling so that is what is clear message and it should be you know unambiguous take care of the airway it is ambiguous and what do i mean by do i want him to be intubated do i want him to be masked bag masked or whatever so be clear in your message it should be a clear message using person's first name talking with eye contact close loop communication is another very important part of the for, uh, for success of a of a team effort and that is whoever is given the message repeats the message okay i'll 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 do the next slide okay and i'll do this okay and i have done it you know when you have finished that job i'll give 30 300 mg please give 300 mg of amodron to the patient and flush with 20 ml of saline okay i'll give 300 mg of amodron and will flush with 20 ml saline will lift raise the arm so that means whatever has been told to me i have registered that i have not heard it wrong i i will not make the mistakes and once i have completed that job assigned to me the team coordinator coordinator will know that now i am free for the next uh, next job to be allotted to me this is what is closed loop communication and at all times we must ensure that we talk in a language which is not hurting you know we may be the closest of friends but when we are working as a team in a group in a in a whatsapp group in a in a in a in a in a video chat in anywhere the the language that we use for each other has to be such that it it, it exudes respect for each other uh, so uh, if i say dr shakti will you do the next slide okay that's very nice thank you dr rakesh or similarly thanks dr sunil for doing this uh, great presentation on ad we'll continue from there just a, a couple of messages here and there which makes everybody happy and finally ends up in a great team effort <clears throat> and outcomes improve remarkably so that is what is all the eight components of a, 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 an effective resuscitation team dynamic i feel that it is effective team of any kind so this is one thing which uh, uh, i think all of us when we check the any 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 team for their uh, their uh, their 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 uh, 
activity level and their perfection level this is something we which we must look at very carefully isn't it dr shakti i think you are a master assessor for many many years uh, i think this is one thing which you stress a lot on yeah the team dynamics have to be stressed because sometimes uh, uh, the assessors are working uh, with the team uh, there are two assessors sometimes three assessors okay uh, so all these roles and responsibilities and how to communicate and what to communicate uh, we usually follow uh, and and we are also working uh, with the uh, hospital concern where we see to it that uh, uh, the uh, team dynamics and mutual respect is maintained at all times yes okay so do i carry on okay yeah. so let me summarize uh, quickly the the steps of advanced life support when that advanced team comes we are already doing the the basic life support is carrying on and the if the team members are now there which are there they they will make the primary assessment and management and will look for the cause why the patient is here which is called the secondary assessment and management i'll quickly run through these the primary assessment is made up of a b c d e advanced uh, a b c d e which means uh, the primary assessment of airway and breathing how is the patient doing now we had done it by just looking at the chest count uh, seeing that the patient is breathing or not now we have the monitors with us we have the devices with us we have the oxygen we have monitors with us so we can assess uh, respiration using the monitors and can give start giving oxygen to the patient and manage this by using advanced airway devices which come right from bag mask we have talked about but supraglottic airway devices which you can see on the screen or an endotracheal intubation if required and all these things whether they are working fine or not oxygen is available and all these are working or not we can check and monitor by using advanced monitors which we have at this point of time the advanced team has it with it the advanced uh, uh, c of the of uh, primary assessment means that we are continuing with high quality chest compression one thing uh, that is the core thing we are using the defibrillator as and when prompted by the defibrillator or aed but at the same time we are putting the iv lines we are doing the sampling and we are giving fluids and drugs as and when required depending upon the 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 condition of the patient and as guided by the team coordinator so this is the primary assessment and management which is happening simultaneously while the bls part is going on the 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 d part of primary abcd is now looking at the disability which is in the form of whether the patient now has become alert because he start we started with unresponsive patient we were in the code blue now he can become when he we tends to become responsive there may be a situation when he is responsive only to only to deep pain or just on uh, shouting or he or she becomes totally alert so the disability is ranked on the basis of his level of alertness and then we also rule out whether the patient is in uh, uh, this condition because of a stroke or an ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke and we also can at this time assess the pupils of the patient till now we were just bothered about the resuscitation of the patient and uh, we had not taken a look at the pupils at all not nor was it needed now we can uh, look for to look for any neurological uh, problems or disability which is there in the patient and the and the secondary or the primary e is expose the patient so that we do not miss out uh, any finding which we had missed till now which is in the form of a trauma or a bleeding or a burn or unusual presentation or something or a medical alert which the patient was wearing so but remember that we expose it only to look for all these things and re uh, clothe the patient or cover the patient so that the patient doesn't remain exposed during the rest of the thing so this was the primary abcde which is uh, taken care of by the team coordinator or the team member or whoever is allotted the job and at the same time the secondary assessment and management steps come in where you look for uh, the differential diagnosis why this patient is still not recovering why this patient has got has gotten into this situation and that is simply remembered by in, uh, sample history if we have missed any part of the history one of the team members who is free in between those 2 minutes of uh, compression cycles 
uh, the person who is on the monitor can have time and go to the patient and do the sample history by which we need mean uh, the signs and symptoms are reassessed how the whole uh, is the patient having any allergies any medication the patient was on when was the last dose taken when the past what is the past medical history which is related especially to this current illness that we are looking at l is for last meal when did the patient have the last meal and what are the events which have led to this situation so all this is easily remembered by a mnemonic called sample and so it is called sample history and at the same time we look for reversible causes in forms of h's and t's these are the h's and t's that we look for and basically we are looking for a reversible cause as dr shakti dr sneel dr misra have told you all the high quality resuscitation is all about gaining time gaining time for, uh, saving the atps on the heart allowing it the best chance to come out giving defibrillation fast but at the same time if we are we can find out a reversible cause the h's and t's and we can reverse that the chances of the patient recovering and maintaining that recovery become multi multiple fold so this is what is the the primary a b c d e and uh, uh, the secondary uh, assessment and management stage which we do during an advanced team being there so out of the six people one person is deputed for uh, some of the activities and the team coordinator keeps on doing some part of what i talked about and then of course the team person the team members the team coordinator should know the cardiac arrest algorithms right and the and that means the person is still unresponsive and the patient doesn't have a carotid pulse that is one re, that is the area that is when we call the person is in cardiac arrest and the cardiac arrest as has dr sneel has very clearly told you can be with a situation where is shockable we had used the uh, aed in that situation or it is a non shockable rhythm like an asystole or a pea now because we are in an advanced center we have a monitor on front of us which is showing us whether and and there are people who are advanced life support providers they can understand they can identify whether the rhythm is shockable that means a ventricular fibrillation or a pulseless ventricular tachycardia or a pulseless Uh, or or a, or a, a non shockable situation which is an asystole or a pulseless electrical activity uh, the there are two limbs which you can see of this algorithm the shockable side and the non shockable side whether the, the 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 people who are doing the code blue they know the shockable rhythms or they are doing it well or not <clears throat> or they are non shockable rhythms which are the the two at the bottom <clears throat> the flat line or very few beats less than 6 beats with no carotid pulse with that is known as asystole and the last one which looks like a wonderful ecg recording but there is no carotid pulse that is what is called a pulseless electrical activity so all code members should be able to identify at least these four situations which can be there and they should not miss out on any shockable situations where they, where where and they give the shock as soon as the shocking shocking uh, uh, sh device whether it is an aed or a defibrillator is available so this is what uh, the 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 advanced life support side of the code blue is all about uh, is that fine dr shakti do you want me to uh, can we uh, elaborate on the uh, how to give uh, uh, how to find out the rhythm shockable and how when to give cpr and along with the drugs when what time the uh, epinephrine is given and what time the amadron okay. is given okay uh, a little so, about it because uh, it is an essential part whenever we go and visit uh, some hospitals there yeah. are some uh, these guidelines are there but there are some sometimes there are old guidelines so what okay. is the updated guideline uh, can we elaborate on that okay so what what uh, so let us go back to the team once again friends so the team has come in the the people have been assigned their roles there was somebody uh, has uh, uh, put the monitors and these are the one of these two rhythms which you can see on the monitor and the everybody in the team is alerted that we have got a rhythm which is on the top if you look this is a ventricular fibrillation and the lower one is a ventricular tachycardia but as we said on right on the top that there is no carotid pulse both these situations are cardiac arrest situations but these are shockable situations on this side of the screen 
so vf and pulseless ventricular tachycardia so what do we do at this time the team members are there the chest compression is continuing so we are the first thing which we want to do is we want to give shock as early as possible so we presume that the person has got a defibrillator so the team coordinator the person who was on the monitor he tells that person okay let us say dr anil is on the on the on the on the monitor and dr shakti is leading the charge so dr shakti says dr anil uh, dr anil will you please sh give shock to the patient uh, give uh, 150 joules of uh, 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 shock to the patient so dr anil misra immediately you know closes the loop yes uh, charging i'll give 150 joules of shock to this patient right uh, the chest person on chest compression let us say sunil was continuing with chest compression he says dr sunil uh, i i hope the chest compressions are fine he says fine they are nice and the person on the airway manages that so the so dr misra has charged and the, the the there is a sound of continuous beep which comes on the defibrillator and that means it is charged so anil immediately says the 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 defibrillator is charged so he applies the gel and makes sure that the gel is nicely spread the patient's chest is exposed so he places the uh, pedals at the right place and he presses them down and looks around and looks whether no anybody is touching the patient or not i clear you clear everybody clears looks around ensures that nobody is touching the patient giving shock at 3 3 2 1 shock so he presses both the buttons on the pedal on both the pedals simultaneously that is when the shock when the shock is delivered the shock is delivered and he says shock delivered so immediately in the meantime the two people who are giving chest compression and breathing or any two people they will shuffle so that the compressor changes after every 2 minutes as dr uh, misra has told you and everybody has told you so the chest compression begins immediately after giving chest compression so after giving shock so once one shock is given with the second shock we uh, if the, by that time the person doesn't get reverted to normal and the return of spontaneous circulation is not there the person is also given uh, epinephrine at that point of time so the the team coordinator tells the person on the iv line that uh, get ready with the epinephrine 1 ml to be diluted in 10 ml of saline and keep the 20 ml of saline flush ready okay so uh, the person let us say i am on the uh, or dr atul is on that side dr atul says okay i am getting epinephrine ready diluted to 10 ml 20 ml is ready great well done this is all mutual respect and the chest compression continues after 2 minutes the record person says the 2 minutes over okay so can we have the rhythm can we see the rhythm okay the rhythm the person on the rhythm says the rhythm is still shockable it is still vf okay give second shock so mishra is ready anil is ready he charges the thing and again looks around and looks for the in the meantime the compressor shuffles the person on the iv line is ready with the epinephrine so the second shock is given shock delivered the compression starts once again at the same time the person on the uh, per, uh, on the on the iv line says should i give the epinephrine yes please do go ahead 20, uh, 10 ml of 1 in 1000 1 in 10000 epinephrine given and the uh, and the iv is flushed and i have raised the arms great job well done and the, the we are ready for the for the next cycle and at the end of the uh, with the third cycle if the still it is a shockable rhythm if this is the time when amiodron 300 mg is given in an adult if amiodron is not available then lignocaine 1.5 mg per kg is given so this is the way the cycle goes on so every 2 minutes a shock is delivered and with the second shock we give epinephrine with the third shock we give epin amiodron with the fourth shock we give epinephrine once again with the fifth shock we go on to amiodron half the dose so this is the way the algorithm goes on the shockable side on the non shockable side it is very important to understand that a flat flat line or an asystole or a pulseless electric activity is a very dangerous situation so first of all again reiterate five h's and five t's is there any reversible thing which we are missing if that reversible thing is there please take care of that immediately at the same time it is not a shockable situation so every as soon as we have the iv line in place and the h's and t's have been taken care of the we will immediately give epinephrine on this side uh, the same dose and it will be repeated every two cycles so uh, once i have given it after 
four minutes, I'll give it once again. After four minutes, I may need to give it once again. At the same time, the chest compression, high quality, carries on. Carries on. At any time, the rhythm becomes shockable. We go on to the shockable side. At any time, on both the algorithms, when the patient becomes conscious, he is responsive. So, return of spontaneous circulation happens. The team hands over that patient to the ICU team to manage the post cardiac arrest uh, scenario of the patient. Does that uh, is yeah. that uh, Dr. Rakesh, you have beautifully explained the algorithm part yeah. and the team uh, dynamics, <clears throat> which is an yes. essential part in uh, saving the lives. So uh, one one thing which I can before I hand you over, this uh, we said in the beginning that the philosophy of resuscitation involves prevention uh, in a, in a huge huge way. Uh, uh, Dr. Atul, we have seen that if the person is shifted to the ICU before he gets into cardiac arrest. If we can identify the situation where the patient can go into arrest and they are shifted into the cardiac arrest, the chances of their survival neurologically intact increases to almost 36 to 40 percent. But if they get arrested in the ward, they are resuscitated there and then shifted to the ICU, the chances go down to as low as 14 to 18 percent. So a huge 100 percent change. So it is, uh, you know, you, you, are the, uh, you are the people who are uh, visiting and uh, standardizing all the things. I'm sure that you know about these rapid response teams which have come up in a big way in most of these hospitals. And these re rapid response teams are the ones which, uh, which are formed of the absolutely frontline people, the interns, the first year postgraduates, the nurses, even the, uh, even the attendants and technicians. They, they, they are objectively uh, uh, you know, looking at the patient and identifying that the patient has the patient's condition has deteriorated, and they are given objective criteria. Okay, this patient's pulse rate is 100. If it jumps beyond 140, if it goes below 60, please alert the rapid response team so that they can stabilize the patient before, as soon as they become unstable, right? And they start acting and they prevent the person going into a, a, a an arrest situation where we needed to go for the code blue. So the rapid response team is a, is a very big uh, plus point wherein we actually prevent risks and uh, need for code blue. So, uh, so I'll this hand is, over to Dr. Shakti to- this, this was the stitch in time that saves nine. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. yeah. Uh, this is probably beautifully used in the COVID times, right? Uh, with the market in the pulse, uh, the SPO2 goes below 94%. Time to shift to the hospital. The respiratory rate goes above this value. Time to shift to the hospital. Only that uh, decreases the strain on the hospital also, and the patient is optimized early also. And from hospital one ward to the ICU, when do they shift yes. to the ICU? Yes, and so on. Yeah. So they have made criteria uh, in this also. Uh, so just to summarize uh, the whole thing, that the uh, code blue situations are often sudden and unanticipated. And if you are not prepared uh, for the code blue situation, uh, chaos will follow. But we want you to be prepared for code blue situations so that uh, the code blue team works smoothly and the members of the code blue team may have, uh, they have been trained individually, but they, in a bigger hospital, they may have never met. Or they must have seen that, yeah, he's working in this hospital. Anna? So they have not previously worked together, but as Dr. Rakesh earlier said, that the language of resuscitation is same everywhere. So if you have learned the language of resuscitation, whatever situation you are in, whether you are in a hospital situation, outside the hospital situation, whether you are in India or abroad, the language of resuscitation remains same. So if you have learned the correct methods, the systematic methods of how to perform a CPR, then the language of resuscitation is same. So you will gel within the team. So team members, uh, who are working in the uh, code blue team, they have certain key responsibilities and you have to uh, follow those responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So a methodical approach and accurate documentation is also very essential uh, to have the best chances of successful resuscitation. Now, the decisions, as I earlier said, that taken in first few minutes of the code will make a difference between living and dead. Now, <clears throat> every code blue situation is a stressful situation and it is time sensitive. So you have to think fast, you have to act according to guidelines and you have to adequately train yourself for code blue 
like on mannequins or simulations which are an undisputed necessity so these kind of uh, webinars which dr atul kochar has uh, envisaged and uh, brought us in uh, i thank dr atul kochar for this that, that he has thought of it that we are training people uh, for code do and the uh, nabh under the guidance of uh, dr atul kochar has recognized uh, this uh, that there was some lacuna in the code do which the assessors were going or the hospitals were facing so it is uh, it is a targeted and continuous training uh, of the uh, hospital staff and the code blue staff which is ideal situation and if we can treat these uh, if we can treat these patients effectively they will survive so chances of survival increases and simulation and these frequent trainings are a good uh, so once you are uh, trying to improve the code blue performance you can assure overall quality of the care you are greatly reduces stress level of the all the staff members because if they know they know what to do the, if they don't know the stress comes in and the major part impact of code blue performance is that there is a return of spontaneous circulation so once we do good code blue we are gel like a team there is a return of spontaneous circulation in many cases and this also ensures uh, improved data collection we can uh, see uh, the kappa also corrective and preventive actions can be done and the liability risk of the hospital is also reduced if we see because many uh, come uh, to the delhi medical council that this person has not been treated well so all these things the liability uh, which the hospital faces they will also reduce if you have well documented your core team is good then the liability also reduces now the role of any assessor that means it is not the assessor which is going from nabs side it is the simulation part also which the hospital is also doing he is also assessing themselves whether the code blue team which we have formed is it uh, is it the training on code blue evident or not so those and how quickly the resources are provided is there some resource shot because sometimes when the core team comes the defibrillator might not be working Uh, or some other instrument is not working maybe uh, so once something falls apart uh, the everything goes down now so we have to assess train assess train assess regularly so that uh, now the key components which are important in this situation is whether you are familiar with the code you have delegated the clear roles and responsibilities to each team member and you are performing the high cpr as per the guidelines the latest guidelines and you have accurately uh, documented whatever is uh, there now once you have all these documented the as you have seen through this presentation that it is very simple many there are many situations which will come across but there is a common approach and once you learn this common approach it will have de stressing effect on the team work so simulation learning by webinars and uh, on mannequins it is essential part uh, and i thank dr atul that you have uh, invited us for this uh, so many situations we have we have discussed uh, dr akesh dr sunil and dr misra and with you dr atul uh, so this is unique is it is very simple if you have learnt it it is very simple language of resuscitation is simple uh, it is a common approach and team work is what will save the patients uh, if uh, dr atul you have any questions uh, or the participants yes, sir, sir. Yeah. i mean firstly i mean uh, you don't need to thank us sir uh, it is uh, on behalf of nabh and the entire fraternity uh, we are deeply intensely grateful actually for this wonderful training and uh, we also realize that uh, there are constraints because we have attended your live trainings and uh, webinars cannot uh, be a substitute for a closed door you know small group training but but still Uh, we have had a excellent response just to uh, tell you that uh, 990 people on zoom platform and uh, on the webcast uh, uh, till abhi as a real thing also 425 uh, people are there 
and uh, on a top level 645 people so total of about 1500 people learned from you we have had a pan india representation from every state from jharkhand vijayawada mysore uh, i can see the list and, and they they are all complimenting sir they are all complimenting there are whole lot of compliments rajasthan um uh, and and a big team from indraprastha polo because they all have uh, mentioned and some of very senior assessors principal assessors have logged in uh sandhya shankar madam uh, josephine madam so there are so many of us uh, across so they have attended and there are a whole lot of questions also dr vp singh knows he has a legal question actually uh, there are many comments there are many questions i'll just take few one is how to proceed if relatives of patient uh, refuse cpr this is from dr vp singh md llb so this is a valid question actually can patients relative refuse for i mean we already have dnar uh, can we stop sharing screen sir i mean uh, so that people can yeah. see you i mean there are there are some constraints of this zoom and webinar because at a given time people have logged in through a mobile device they may not be able to see all of them uh, okay sir so uh, any any comments on that it can the we don't want to have a detailed uh, this thing there are many technical questions about cop yeah. to be this that, uh, but the, uh, the dnr is uh, a recognized entity uh, which sure. the patients can give advance uh, in an advance uh, maybe the patients who are uh, moribund conditions advanced cancer stage uh, which are difficult to uh, get resuscitated a uh, patient is a 95 year old uh, male who has uh, suffered many comorbid conditions has a cancer which is flourishing he has pain he has given a advanced uh, notification that he should not be resuscitated in those cases yes we can uh, but i think uh, if you may allow me to intervene i think the question uh, is meant for a situation where you want to do it and the patient's relative don't do i understand it right dr atul So no, just written that how to proceed if relatives of a patient refuse CPR. I mean, this yeah, is a, I, I, uh, I personally mean, feel that uh, usually when we are asked this question in our uh, sessions, it means that uh, we think that there is a chance that we can salvage the patient. The patient's relative don't, you know, and they don't want us to do anything. So uh, that is a slightly tricky situation, if I may say, because if we feel that the patient is salvageable and uh, uh, there are there can be medical legal implications for the reasons why they don't want the patient to be you know uh, resuscitated so i feel that uh, as a uh, please correct me dr sunil uh, that if we feel that this is a salvageable situation we will have to make tell the patient that uh, uh, this is a situation where we are very uh, reasonable there is a reasonable chance of saving this patient if it is a moribund cancer patient uh, whatever in that case i am sure it will be immediately decided that okay very well good i think we should not and so advance can, directive huh? if we can take care of the reversible causes we yeah. know what are why patient went to cardiac arrest i think it hmm. will be criminal if we don't resuscitate correct of the relative missing i i concur sir totally. there might be i there is another angle which just occurred to me uh, we have been talking about i mean you, we keep reading about and hearing about doctors being assaulted in all kinds of hospitals government hospitals private hospitals now it brings me back to the scene safety situation if we first try and communicate with the family and say this is like uh, dr sunil said that this is a reversible condition we should attempt it if they try to physically stop us by threats or whatever means i think wisdom lies probably in ensuring scene safety and informing the security or whoever and documenting this i think uh, Uh, the the question might have originated from there what do we do to ensure our own safety as healthcare providers if such a situation arises i think with that we can leave out of this yeah, discussion yeah. because then so, it will complicate a lot true. no no i mean it, it, true enough the patient very important doesn't I think want that's very important there yeah, i know it's very uh, very so, important so so, so, so yeah. we i i just tried to put it in a nutshell this could yes. be the concern and this is probably what absolutely. we should absolutely right any other yeah. question there's another point sir the which dilip mk wants to know that considering the pandemic i mean you already answered that actually dr chakti beautifully that uh, any advice for the public i mean suppose <clears throat> somebody in the public and somebody collapses wearing a mask on or something uh, then what is the advice but you already i think mentioned very clearly that uh, uh, giving breaths is an option 
I mean, yeah. if you uh, the loan uh, loan uh, loan rescuer and uh, you you can only you know, give only give uh, chest compressions. Correct, sir. And it is, has, it is also recommended that the mask on the patient's face should stay there. because during chest compression also there is aerosolization yes and therefore if a mask whether it is an oxygen mask or a plain mask which the patient is wearing let it be there okay sir and there is there are comments like gorav says that adequate number of aed should be there at every uh, area of hospital and nabh should make it mandatory so i mean uh, that is uh, to be discussed and mr jalil says that ngo government should provide aed is at all Pieces of mass gathering. So I think uh, this is a very wonderful idea. Wonderful idea. And we should make efforts for that. Uh, so how many compressions for a child? So Kamal Ji uh, wants to know that how many compressions for a child. The compression yeah. rate uh, for a child remains the same as an adult if there is a single rescuer. If, Correct. however, there are two rescuers, then from thirty compressions and two breaths, it goes on to fifteen compressions and two breaths. Okay. So, but the duration for one cycle i mean one complete cycle remains about approximately 2 minutes which means about uh, instead of five such cycles you will have about eight or nine such cycles before the two minutes are completed and uh, dr mahesh kakadia wants to know that approximate price of aed that is one and four times he has mentioned that please make this thing available on the site because i missed some portions so uh, first part you can the price uh, varies from uh, 75000 to 150000 okay and maybe the 50000 but whenever you someone is buying the ad one has to ascertain that it conforms to some standards like the us fda or the european c even the local mates are available but uh, since this device has to be 100% accurate in detecting the ventricular fibrillation so we cannot compromise on that so there has to be it has to be standard uh, some conform to some standards one and, like and, it, oh, and it should, should also be uh, uh, conforming to the latest guidelines oh, maybe absolutely. some old aids are available which are not conforming to the latest guidelines correct so that's i think that's very very important uh, for every uh, procurement team also in any hospital to look into the latest and not go for l1 only because lives are yeah. at stake yeah and uh, so uh, the is, is the pocket mask single use i mean there are questions about that no it is a single use it is single use sir it is single use, use. not costly mask has... yeah not costly okay. 300 rupees a pocket what is the price range sir what is the price range for the pocket mask 300 rupees approximately okay so it is a uh, okay then uh, there is a pramod says table top assessment table top training I, i think we can because sir we realize that uh, uh, having attended your core trainings that uh, though this uh, web and virtual training has been very useful but we need more closed door trainings actually uh, on a smaller number where you engage everybody and if it's a live training then you actually make people do the compressions which yeah. entire any office yes, also sir. you were so we are grateful that we you trained so and again and again we have to revisit and do hands on training in smaller yes, populations there is no substitute and there are lots of comments are excellent and and uh, dr rakesh sir i think there are wonderful comments because you spent so much time on the team dynamics and uh, Uh, we, as a assessor which dr shakti said we with that and we see that majority of these code blue teams are the best people of that hospital you know majority of our hospitals take great pain in choosing the right team but but some where we have gone uh, I, i personally say myself they they are doing lip service i mean they don't know the basics of m1 m2 m6 each role each defined so they should not go i mean uh, through the motions but actually be involved and uh, what is the role of a recorder i mean, I, I, i think that was a very beautiful small sub session if i can say on the effective communication that was, and that effective was, that is what your team doctor, actually that is very, very shakti told me that this is a very important part and spend more time on that so and it is very close to our heart also because uh, we feel wonderful that, wonderful i i think uh, i mean your wonders. correct sir correct sir so i think uh, this is and and there are actually if i could start reading the compliments uh, which are there on the website i mean there, there are many actually so maybe i'll post them individually to you uh, any other thing which uh, 
there are still many people there sir so any any specific precaution purnima wants to know about women patients actually so women patient and disrobing in public and all that so any any sensitivities involved there how can because you have to expose and it is the question of life so what is anil, your anil, take anil 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 touched upon I, that he can yeah. elaborate uh, i understand the the issue being uh, exposing the patient's chest uh, uh, on a roadside or in public when there are people around um, there is a very simple solution you see the point is the whole idea of exposing the chest was to identify the right space where to give compressions right which is roughly mid sternal so the other way of doing that is without exposing the chest is somebody can feel where the jugular notch is with one hand feel where the zephy sternum is with the other finger find the center spot and without exposing the chest try and do compressions there i mean this is a, a close approximation i would say and i will again request that even in uh, even when we are doing that if we have a lady around he or she the uh, you know uh, open the uh, undergarment so that they are out of the way beneath the skirt or shirt or whatever so that you know sometimes there is a, a kind of a spring kind of a thing which will the, reduce the the the, uh, the effectivity of the of the chest compression so just pull it up or down some lady can do that under the uh, upper garment and or you can put part a chinni on top of yes, it part two of the same question is that purnima kulkarni wants to know that uh, can can we put a like uh, aed pad on the clothes no i mean no. The, the that, that is exactly what i was yeah. saying that you can put a chinni or a uh, or a sari on top of it but once the ed pads are needed they have to go below that sari or below that you know on the skin, on the skin. directly on the skin. it is, it is, it is, the skin is only only meant for hindi movies where you can do it over and over coat mm-hmm. also yeah. because uh, i i in the special situations i told you that even the hairy chest uh, which is fully exposed mm-hmm. the hairs itself can cause some obstruction so those hairs also have to be shaved It's a one very important point, Doctor Mishra probably always says that he makes this before going into any resuscitation out of the hospital. Announce, I am so and so. I am doctor. I want to help this patient. Correct. So actually, since you are not making scenes safe for the patient, you are telling the people, I am doctor, making scenes safe for yourself. That's very important. And uh, just just before the wrap up, there is one thing uh, which I'd like to say. Uh, I guess. when we give them the message that they must practice and uh, before they use it on patients every time they use code blue this is something which we do all the time and we train they should always have a debriefing session when they use it in real life situation after they have dealt with it the team uh, the, the code blue team should review what they had done because that should be a learning process also not just a self assessment but also a learning process correct sir i i think the uh, there is so much to learn actually but you covered also i mean to say that so much in including the rapid response teams the team dynamics the importance of each and every member of this thing effective communication bls then the basics of advanced life support i mean so uh, but uh, once again i think uh, i think we'll keep revisiting this again and again and all those who are, are keen to revisit the same link youtube maintains that link till evening so that is they can keep revisiting and uh, seeing that link again and again that is one thing we'll seek your proper permission to maybe edit and put it at a later date on our website also and we'll encourage people to attend those core trainings also because they cannot be a substitute uh, i mean this webinar cannot be a substitute for a closed group training with practical hands on experience i mean so th- that is something uh, i think people uh, there is a limitation of these webinars that is fun uh, but really grateful sir for sparing your invaluable time to be and spend this prime time actually uh, we know that uh, dr chakti is still in hospital dr sunil sir i mean all of you i mean you spared your invaluable time to be with us and be with us sirs and on behalf of nabh on behalf of entire audience uh, who are there still there are about uh, 400 people logged in uh, from this and 5 and 900 people are still on with us sir i mean so uh, so really grateful and all those who are uh, watching so thank you so much once again all of you and uh, once again uh, to all the audience the wonderful audience who are with you you please
keep visiting our website nabh.co for updates we are uh, enhancing our uh, quality connect initiative which will bring you a whole lot of trainings including clinical audit every every aspect of quality because these will be free to air uh, uh, trainings by taken by master assessors also master practitioners also and masters of quality from all over uh, uh, india and international so this will this is our uh, nabh's nabh tribute to all you people doing good quality work there so thank you so much once again all of you and uh, we'll log off now and keep visiting our website for updates and keep registering on our site for these free trainings thank you so much once again thank you thank, thank, you. thank you very much thank you. thank you ladies and gentlemen thank you sir thank you